How are you feeling? Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Yeah? Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. Mic's up there, so, okay. you know, aim your mouth that way. Okay. Should I brush my teeth? <laughs> Positive culture. It's my body to give. Are threesome gifts a thing? Taking a bra off. I like your bed. Horizontal. 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 This is Horizontal with Lila. I'm Lila and I'm Horizontal. I'm Kennedy and I'm also Horizontal. That'll do. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Welcome into Horizontal, the podcast about intimacy of all kinds. That's recorded while the opposite of vertical. Horizontal aims to make private conversations public in order to dispel shame, diminish loneliness, and cultivate human connection. To paraphrase my eloquent listener, Ghost Heart, I take you into my bed and let your ears watch as I unzip intimate conversations. In this episode, recorded on my Horizontal Does America road trip, I lie down with Kennedy. Kennedy is the young wife of my college friend, Tom. Tom and I went to theater school together at NYU. I think he graduated one year before me in 2002. I had a thing for Tom. I'm pretty sure we had sex. He's pretty sure we didn't. We're friends now. I visited him on my first cross-country road trip in 2009 when he was single and working as a bartender. And I visited him on my second, now that he has a two-year-old, a house, a wife, and works as a school teacher at a magnet high school. During October and November of 2017, I drove 10,700 miles in a Honda Civic by myself, every single mile of it. Oh, it was delicious. I circumnavigated the U.S. with two intentions. One, to feel free. And two, to record with as many fascinating people as possible. At 20 years old, Kennedy is a mother, a college student, a giver of care, a seeker, a brave, humble warrior. She is a survivor of sexual assault who doesn't like to use those words. She doesn't wish to identify with victimhood. She doesn't want people to see that as her whole identity. It is a prime example of a great sickness within our society that a woman who is harmed should be blamed for having been harmed and then further judged and blamed for using the accurate term victim to describe the role that she has been forced into. I am appalled that she even has to worry about this. It is only a small part of the story of Kennedy, but it is a part of that story. And we both know that silence doesn't help. We know that silence and secrecy have caused women to suffer more egregiously than their wounds ever necessitated. We know that silence and secrecy has kept many of us from receiving proper treatment for trauma and mental health. We know that we don't want this to happen anymore. And that she, like I, wants us to be free. To express our sexuality in any way that feels right and meaningful and joyous to us. To love whomever we wish to love whenever we love them. To speak aloud about the things that have happened to us. To put forth our own stories in the hopes that others may not need to live in shame. I am deeply honored by Kennedy's vulnerability and the generosity required of her to share that vulnerability with me and with you. I hope you, too, honor it. At first, when I arrived at Tom's place in early October, I was concerned that Kennedy might not like me. As it turned out, she was concerned that I might not like her. Because, due to some disappointingly backwards closed-mindedness, 
more than a handful of Tom's friends, and I say that in quotation marks, friends, were unkind to both of them when they got together. It is hard for me to understand why a true friend would stand in the way of you loving another consenting adult. But that's what happened. But I was delighted to see my friend so happy. In this episode, we discuss topics that have never before been broached on this podcast. Childbirth and the sex afterwards, mismatched libidos, and being a young mother. If you are moved by our work together, become a part of it through patreon.com slash horizontal with Lila. If you aren't familiar with it, Patreon is a life changer for independent artists with the desire to make lawless, uncensored, and undiluted work. It allows each of you to become a patron of the horizontal arts and to gain access in various ways to this process of spreading intimacy. You can become a patron at the base level for $2 a month, and the awards get more sumptuous as you offer more. Patreon is spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash horizontal with Lila. All right, let's get to the episode, dear ones. Come on, come lie down with us. Tom gave me nothing. Really? Nothing good. Really? Yeah, because it was all like, he was being super careful and it was... About what? About what he shared about other people and so... Why? I mean, it's not like he had to say names. I know, and he didn't. I was expecting him to have great stories and I think he does have great stories. He just won't share them. <laughs> I know. It was very frustrating. You guys both toss around the word loser a lot. <laughs> <laughs> What's up with that? We always call each other losers. It's terrible. I don't like it at all. It's so unkind. <laughs> <laughs> it's more of a term of endearment at this point. <laughs> so... <laughs> Yuck. I mean, I don't want to yuck your <laughs> yum, but... I mean, we also call each other very nice things. <laughs> you do? Yeah. Okay. Like what? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not in the moment, so... Like, honey bear? Oh, like... Yeah, like sugar and... Honey and babe and all those very nice things. <laughs> and also loser. And also loser. But usually we do it like through a cupped hand like this. We go, loser. <laughs> <laughs> Kennedy. I just want to, I just want to have the kind of conversations we were having earlier and I think a good place to start is usually what kind of sex ed you had growing up. Oh, I had no sex ed growing up. I mean, we had, like, the movie in school that they make you watch. What's that? What does it consist of? So the boys and girls are separated, and the girls' film goes through, like, periods and those types of womanly things. And not only things, not only women get periods, but... Yes, um, the, those kind of vaginal things, yes, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> um, and then it talks about how a sperm fertilizes an egg, and um, that is done by having sex, and then you get pregnant. And then you get pregnant. Yeah. And don't do that because you'll get pregnant. Yeah, and then also when we got older in high school, sex ed... Um, there was this weird slideshow that the PE teacher showed us that was all just pictures of STDs on genitals. <laughs> and oh. he was basically like, 
well, if you have sex, this will happen to you. Oh, my God. Yeah. You're, like, guaranteed STD. Yeah. And then also a very grotesque film of a woman giving birth, which, like, bothers me as a mother because I don't think – I think that that is what sort of perpetuates women going into birth fearfully. Thinking that it's going to be like a murder scene, like a crime scene. Yeah. Um, And that's not what a birth is. Birth can be very traumatic. But if you have the right care providers and the right support network and you educate yourself and you understand that you're in control and you deserve to be respected, then I think that birth can be very healing and magical and Because all the movies I've ever seen show the woman just writhing and shrieking in agony. Yeah, and it's definitely not the best feeling of her being in labor. (laughs) But I do think that when I was in transition, going from active labor to the pushing stage was the closest I've ever been to an out-of-body experience. It was the most intense thing I've ever experienced in my life. Can you walk me through it? Yeah. So I had a lot of pre-labor with Elva. I had contractions that would stop and start for weeks before her due date. What does that feel like? It feels sort of like a tightening in your abdomen and then really bad period cramps. Ooh. Yeah. So I had that and then her due date came and went. And it was funny because my midwives all kept telling me I, I was dilated before then. And they were like, you're probably going to go early. You're showing all the signs of progressing. And then Elva ended up being a week late. I went into labor on a Saturday morning. And Tom and I were out walking around. It was the middle of winter. We were <laughs> walking the aisles of Home Depot and Target and anywhere we could find that was warm and inside to walk because mm. that's the best way to get your baby to sort of engage in your birth canal. Oh, I could just picture you walking <laughs> yeah. up and down Target yeah. aisles and Home Depot. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then finally I was like, okay, we just need to go to the hospital. It, it was getting to the point where I was, you know, struggling through contractions and sort of struggling to speak through them. And we got there, and my midwife was like, yeah, you're in labor. You're four centimeters dilated. You're having regular contractions. I'm going to have you, you know, bounce on a yoga ball and walk around and, you know, do some hip swiveling to try to get the baby to drop some more. And, and so when you say dilated, it's that the vaginal opening has, has opened it's your, more. It's your cervix. It's your cervix. Yeah. Okay. So standard to – push a baby out you need to be 10 centimeters dilated okay which i want to say is the size of like a cantaloupe like a... <laughs> that makes sense yeah so i was walking around and i just kept stalling out like i just my contractions just kept stopping so i stayed the night in the hospital that night and she said that you know we're going to keep you overnight because I feel like if I send you home, you're just going to come right back here because I'm a first-time mom. So I didn't exactly know what to expect and when, like, what the feeling would be when I'd be like, oh, I really need to go to the hospital now. And so she said that I would probably wake up, you know, progressed to almost being to the pushing stage or I would wake up ready to push. She said that that was usually what happened. And instead I woke up and... In typical Elva fashion, she, you know, was just like, I'm going to do what I want. And I was having no contractions and I hadn't progressed anymore. And so I had to do more laps around the hospital. I was so sore from the previous day, like going up and down steps, just trying ruthlessly to get this baby out. And so we ended up walking from about 8 a.m. to, you know, 11 a.m., And then I took a rest and the midwife came in and I really thought I was going to end up getting sent back home because I was just stalling out again. And 
they hooked me up to the contraction monitor and as she was giving me my options, <laughs> my contractions picked back up and I progressed for another couple of hours just bouncing on the yoga ball and relaxing and then I chose to have my water broken and <laughs> that's when things got real. <laughs> so having your water broken itself doesn't you don't really feel it it just feels you know like a little bit of pressure and then like this huge gush of fluid coming out of you and that's the sac yeah and the first contraction after that you know I was in the bed I was gripping the armrest on the hospital bed and I was like I want the epidural I want the epidural now yeah and I had gone into it really not wanting one and I had you know made it very clear to you know, the people who were there supporting me, Tom, my mom, our friend Pearl, and my midwife, that that wasn't what I wanted. And so when I said that, everyone was kind of like, okay, that's fine, but let's get through this contraction and then we'll talk about it. And of course, you know, I would get through it and then be a little more clear-minded and say, well, no, that's not what I want at all. So about three hours after that, (laughs) which was crazy, I was completely naked I ripped all of my clothes off (laughs) I was running around the hospital room in the birthing tub out of the birthing tub I had the shower head on my back was wanting to be touched was not wanting to be touched Mm. I was like bearing down on the yoga ball and then it was the strangest feeling my body started to sort of push and I, I felt the pressure of Elva's head in my birth canal and I remember sort of like stopping and there was this moment of just absolute clarity that I hadn't had because I had been in, you know, the most intense pain I'd ever been in in my life. And, you know, I'm not I'm not a religious person at all, but I felt like connected to some sort of like ether. Like there was like this huge beam of like energy from somewhere like pulsating down on me and then you know I I was like I'm pushing like I I my body is pushing I wasn't pushing my body was pushing for me and my midwife checked me and 40 minutes later Elva was born I was wondering because why do we need to do all these things to make it happen when ostensibly our ancestors just you know at some point squatted down and their body just birthed a baby I mean the body knows how. Yeah. I mean, we didn't survive millennia not knowing how to give birth. So I think it's because with, you know, the way the medical industry has progressed in the Western world, I think it comes from a place of misogyny, honestly, that these, you know, male doctors are telling women that their bodies don't know how to birth and that it's something they should be afraid of and there are so many stories out there of women who didn't have the birthing experience they wanted or that their birthing experience was very traumatic to them because someone else was calling the shots for them right as as though it's a malady yeah as though they need to be treated for this illness that they have of child birth yeah But then on the contrary, there's, like, this weird, you know, culture about, like, having a a baby body and, like, did you – how fast did you bounce back and how did you lose your baby weight? Which I think is equally as strange because, you you know, giving birth in a way is a trauma to your body. It's – It's absolutely. A a human is exiting your body. (laughs) And, you know, if you're – friend you know had to go have this crazy surgery where they got like their guts cut out or something you're not gonna wonder like oh I wonder what Bob's body looks like after he went through that crazy thing I wonder how long it will take him to get his eight pack back yeah exactly and I think I asked someone the other day how in the world because there it is in the magazines oh the celebrity bounced back She was photographed in Ibiza four weeks after delivering her baby. And they said that they have C-sections. And then when they're sewn back up, they essentially do a tummy tuck. They essentially 
take really? the skin and tuck it under. I've never heard that. I had no idea about that either. But I was wondering how it could be possible to to change one's body after after such an incredible distension of skin. Yeah. In such a quick amount of time. And I think I've actually never heard of women doing that. I I have heard of elective C-sections obviously. I and to a certain extent I do believe that women having options as to how and where and when they want to give birth is a form of respect. Absolutely. And, and empowerment yeah. and and respecting the rights of women to do what they wish with their bodies. Yeah. But I do think that some of the choices that are sometimes made are because there are outside forces affecting that in a way. Like, I think it, a lot of it is fear-based. I need to have an elective C-section or I need to have – I need to be induced before, you know, my belly gets too big because I want to look okay after I give birth, you know? Or, like, I want to have an elective C-section because I don't want my vagina to be ruined by childbirth. Because then who would ever love or want me or find me sexy? And I know women who have chosen to have C-sections. Several of my mother's friends have made that choice. And I do think that elective C-sections are on the decline as of right now. Probably because women are finding, you know that they don't <laughs> owe their postpartum body to anyone and mm -hmm. essentially that their postpartum body is no one's business but their own. I do think that if, you know, you are choosing that for reasons of your own, like maybe you have had a sexual trauma of some sort. I have read a lot about that that, birthing can be very hard if you have had sexual trauma because the hormones that are released are in some of like the same centers of your brain mm. that are activated after a trauma or like if you have PTSD it can make it very hard to give birth I just think that there maybe needs to be more of a push for women to understand that their bodies <laughs> Like, you, you can make a human. Like, you're making another human being, you know? Why would your body ever be the same after that? Like, mm. it, it shouldn't be, and you shouldn't want it to be because... It's got a different job now. Yeah, and, and that's okay, and you can still be sexy and beautiful and hot and whatever else you want to be after giving birth. It doesn't make you some, like, gross old crone, like, oh, I'm a mom now. I, I can't be, I can't, you know, be my own person and be empowered. It, like, being a mother does not have to consume your whole identity. Well, you're very sexy and beautiful and hot. Well, thank you. <laughs> you took me through up until 40 minutes before Elva was born, and then... I had asked you about the, like, if you could walk me through the experience or the sensations of, and then the, yeah. the emotions of, so, of seeing her. Yeah. So when I was pushing, pushing feels like a relief. It doesn't, pushing was the thing that I was most afraid of. I thought that that was going to be the hardest and the most painful, but. Like, it, it sounds like it's going to tear. Yeah. But. When I started pushing, I felt relief and I stopped feeling the pain of the contractions because I was pushing through them. And I did tear a little bit. I didn't have to be stitched or anything like that. And I remember feeling some... Do they put oil or something yeah, my to mid lubricate? I don't believe so. My midwife did do counter pressure with me. So... What does that mean? So she took her thumbs... And the most traumatic tears happen usually when it's going downward, when it's going toward your anus. When the baby's yes. head is going downward. So instead, my midwife was placing counter pressure downward on my vaginal opening so that as the baby's head came up, it would push upward on me. And I did tear 
upward a little bit, but nothing major that had to be stitched or repaired or anything like that. Not to say that it, it isn't still, you know, even a year and a half out, still sensitive. And, you know, you have to be proactive and like really sort of massaging that area to sort of keep the scar tissue a little more loose oh. and break it down a little bit more. Just because if you have hard scar tissue in that area, it can be really sensitive. And and you massage it without any kind of cream? just Yeah, with, like, just with like w- with oil or like coconut oil. Or, oh, so you do. Yeah, or like a lubricant that you like and react well with. Mm-hmm. So the pushing was a relief. And like I said, as she was crowning, I felt a little bit of stinging. But nothing compared. I thought that that was going to be the worst part, and that by far, you know, was mostly the easiest. Um, wow. Yeah. But then when her head came out, I mean, that was the biggest relief. And then when I got through her, so the head is the hardest part. You get the head out, and then as the shoulders come out, it sort of, you know, the baby just sort of comes out very easily the shoulders are the widest part right yeah but the head is the hardest part to get out and then once the head is out your care provider can sort of hook under the shoulders and sort of help you and you know sort of ease the baby out that way and it was funny tom and i both had the same feeling Tom was going to catch the baby. I wanted Tom to catch the baby originally, but when it came time and my midwife was like, okay, it, you know, we're ready for dad down here. I, I said no, and I wanted Tom to stay by me and continue to hold me and support me. How was he positioned? So my mom was to my left side and Tom was to my right side and Pearl was on my left hip helping me with my left leg. <laughs> and you were lying down? No, I was in like an upright seated position holding my legs up with my arms. And Pearl was helping you with this left leg to yeah. keep it up? Yeah. And and Tom had his hands? Just up. around me and holding my hand and holding my arm and sort of, you know, petting my hair and was talking me through everything. And you wanted him to be in the room the whole time? Of, yeah, of you course. You didn't ever kick him out? <laughs> no, no. And I I originally had only wanted Tom in the room, but when it came time to push, I wanted everybody to stay. <laughs> like, no, I need everybody here. You wanted the, yeah. the energetic yeah. support? Yeah, And so... You weren't... I've heard women say that they felt embarrassed because they were going to void their bowels and they didn't want their their partner in the room to see that. So that happens sometimes. That didn't happen to me unless it did and nobody and told me. You didn't uh, notice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Tom and I are very, there's really no body shame or, you know, body fluid shame between us. Yes, you, you've you had a lot of talk about pooping since I've been yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I was definitely not concerned about that and I wasn't concerned about pooping or concerned about him seeing a baby come out of my vagina or anything like that. And he was very supportive and really wanted to be there and wanted to, you know, watch his daughter be born. And so when the midwife, you know, held her up and placed her on my bare chest, it was Tom and I talked about it later and we were both very relieved that we had the same feelings people talk about sort of this euphoric moment this like huge rush of love the second you see your baby yeah and when I saw Alva I sort of was like oh it's you like it was you in there that whole time I was like oh wow she's here that's who's been in there with me this whole time and it wasn't until you know, I was holding Elva skin to skin and starting to nurse her that I really felt that sense of euphoria that people talk about kick in. And it's very interesting because up until more recently, skin to skin and giving the baby directly to the mother wasn't necessarily common practice in America. Usually right. you take the baby to the little 
um, weight table and you clean the baby off and clip the cord and do right. all of that sort of stuff before giving the baby to mom. But I, your baby was given directly to you yeah. before cord cutting. Before cord cutting. That makes perfect anything. sense. Yeah. Why wouldn't you? Yeah. So I wonder if that maybe has something to do with like the ease of nursing because you're releasing that oxytocin you know immediately when the baby is placed on you skin to skin and starts to suckle and so on and so forth so I have heard women talk about how hard it was for them to nurse after having like a c-section or if their baby wasn't given directly to them and I wonder if it's not because you're not like releasing those bonding chemicals right away. Ooh, interesting. And it makes so much from everything that we know about how babies become malformed and don't develop if they are not cuddled and embraced and don't if they don't have the skin contact if they're not you know swaddled and held and it makes so much sense that if you don't have that as your first experience of leaving the body that there would be some complications somewhere along the line because of it. Well, yeah, I mean, I think sometimes we forget that, you know, the baby was in there for nine whole months with you in this sort of, you know, lovely, warm swimming pool right. with a full belly and everything <laughs> you need. And very dark and relaxing in there suddenly it's cold and bright out here yeah there's all these things around i can imagine that you know coming earth side would maybe be a little (laughs) horrifying if if you're immediately placed on this cold hard table (laughs) yes so i think it makes sense that women would struggle more with postpartum things if they're not getting that immediate bonding time not to say that that necessarily even means anything because you know people eventually bond with their children it doesn't mean it's a cure-all but yeah it it seems to be a perfectly logical practice yeah but i think in a lot of hospitals even now it's still not yes which is very interesting (laughs) Um, how long until the cord was cut um we waited longer than normal we waited until the cord completely stopped pulsing so I delivered my placenta and we waited until the cord you know stopped sort of exchanging blood and the placenta was nourishing the baby yeah so the placenta is it's an organ that you grow in your womb that um is connected to the outside of your uterus by I believe they're called uh, villi or villa and that's how the nutrition exchange happens between mother and baby and the placenta is a very interesting thing some people encapsulate their placenta and take it as a pill some people make placenta smoothies some people freeze their placenta and eat it as a steak later what do you make of that? I actually kept my placenta, and our friend Pearl and our friend Derek so graciously brought it home for us while we were in the hospital in a cooler, <laughs> and they cut it in half and put it in our deep freeze, and I was planning on making placenta fajitas around <laughs> the time <laughs> Elva was six months old, but unfortunately, our deep freeze gave up the ghost oh, so i lost no. my placenta and no. placenta fajitas for you yeah and uh <laughs> ounces and ounces of stored breast milk oh yeah so our the breast milk and the placenta are now in our compost and <laughs> we'll hopefully nourish, nourish our the garden. earth yeah. yes yes <laughs> But I I don't know that there's really any scientific evidence that supports that placentas, eating your placenta in any way really prevents postpartum depression or makes your milk supply go up. Do you think it's a superstition? Well, it could be a superstition. It could be just placebo. 
Uh, mm-hmm. But, um, you know, animals in the wild, after they give birth, they eat their placenta immediately, usually. But I think maybe that's m- more as a means of survival because animals don't necessarily know where their next, where the next meal, meal is, is coming from. from. So they're like, oh, this is here. I need to eat this so I, in turn, can <laughs> feed my baby. Right. Um, and, right. you know, I had a hospital room service, so I didn't, you know, <laughs> immediately start munching on my raw placenta. <laughs> And I didn't really have any urge to do that, probably because I wasn't afraid that I that you would perish yeah, yeah. if you didn't. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so. And then you spoke about this moment that you did feel what yeah. all the moms in the world seem to say. So when Elva, you know, she was all gooey and covered in. You know, afterbirth. Slime? Yeah. Is that what it's like? It's yeah. slimy? It's sort of slimy, creamy. It's called vernix. It's like this white goo, basically. Yeah. She had her, they put their a little cap on them right away. And she had this little pink and blue cap that was sort of all gooey and bloody on her head. But uh, Your comfort with fluids is inspiring. I, I just want to say, go yeah, on, go on. I have no weirdness. It's around. amazing. I have a lot of discomfort around fluids, so I really admire it in you. Go well, ahead. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> and, you know, she immediately re- relaxed into me, and she basically just started nursing almost on her own. She knew how to do it, you know. It was instinctual, and she was hungry. Yeah, she was hungry, and I wasn't expecting because breastfeeding always isn't always this easy journey that just happens naturally. I've been told by a few friends that they had trouble breastfeeding, and that it was to them the greatest tragedy that they had experienced. Yeah, and I am very grateful and I had issues with like mastitis and plug ducts which are very painful and irritating but that what's that so you have milk ducts there you when you're breastfeeding it's not just like one sort of main line that comes out it's this (laughs) sort of connection of ducks it's not a single udder yeah yeah. it's a a collection of udders on the inside and so Your milk doesn't come in immediately. What you're first producing is called colostrum, and it's sort of a more concentrated version of breast milk. It's uh, very dense in, like, vitamins and antibodies and stuff like that. So your milk doesn't usually come in for a couple of days after you give birth. And I was out of the hospital when my milk came in because I remember – it was crazy. So I am a small chested woman and I grew a whole cup size while I was pregnant. And I was, you know, pretty high and mighty about it. I was like, dang, look at these <laughs> boobs that I didn't have before. But when my milk came in, it was like sort of an automatic boob job. They grew like almost a whole other cup size and they're like, rock hard and it was like these crazy they looked fake (laughs) (laughs) like just like a bulging like just filled with milk and it was like just within a couple of hours it happened and it was so painful it was so painful because it's just like stretched full and and uh, there's no relief and, yeah. from from yeah and pumping or well that's eventually what I had to do and that's why I had such a stockpile of milk eventually because Elva you know, when babies are tiny they don't eat a ton in one sitting they nurse a little amounts super frequently mm. so usually I would pump a little and then nurse Elva and then pump a little after. But when it first, my milk first came in, I was completely caught off guard because no one had talked about it being, you know, so 
immediate and so painful. So I just remember standing in the shower with like hot water pouring over my boobs and like sort of massaging them down and literally like squirting milk out of my nipples. And it's in several streams? Yeah, or yeah like, a, like just sort of. Like a faucet? Uh, or like a like a spray a sp- sort of like a, sp- a spray sort of from like the a s- water gun shower head okay water gun yeah and <laughs> and I could continue to do that up until about a year out when Elva started to slow down and not nurse as frequently because it was just she's a, a good eater and I was very lucky in that regard that I had no issues with my milk supply. And I do have to thank Tom for that a lot because he was very proactive in making lunches and dinners and keeping me well fed so that I could feed Elva. Mm. Because when you're breastfeeding, you actually have to eat more than when you are supposed to when you're pregnant. Like calories are actually. Oh, I didn't realize yeah. that. What was your relationship to your breast before you started breastfeeding? I had some insecurities about them just because I, you know, was teased in middle school and early high school about having small boobs. And Did you get called names? Oh, yeah. I had the nickname in middle school, ST, small tits. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So that- I remember getting teased for having a flat ass. And now my ass is perfectly round. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also got teased for having... A small butt until I started doing strength training in high school and I had a little bit of a booty there for a while (laughs) and then my a booty grew even more when I was pregnant to counterbalance my huge belly and now I am left with a lovely round butt full of dark stretch marks Mm. which is really the only stretch marks I got other than a little bit around my belly button, which the ones on my belly button, of course, happened in the last week of pregnancy when I was past my due date. And you were doing the whole cream situation, but they happened anyway. Yeah. I think from what I've read and just from other people's experiences that it's more genetic than anything – And it also has to do with an early pregnancy. Like, I think part of the reason why my stretch marks on my butt got so bad so quickly is because I was still wearing, like, my normal jeans, just not buttoned up. So my poor butt was, like, squished. Oh, no. Yeah, and it wasn't, wasn't, like, uncomfortable or anything. It was just um, I wasn't allowing as much room for growth in the booty section as I should have. I didn't even recognize that stretch marks on the butt would be a thing that happened Yeah, from childbirth. Yeah. I, I mean, everything grew. Mm-hmm. I was... I look at photos of when I was nine months pregnant and my face doesn't even look the same. It's like I have weird pregnancy nose. Because you're so tiny. You're a slender human. Yeah, and I did have some weirdness about my postpartum body, especially my vagina. If I have any advice, any unsolicited advice to women who right. um, are pregnant is don't take a mirror down there right away. Oh, because You did? Yeah, I did. And I was, of course, immediately horrified because I had had not allowed any time for my body, one, to, you know, let the inflammation and swelling go down in that area, but two, to heal at all, really. And I thought that I was just mutilated and ruined for life. And at my follow-up appointment six weeks after giving birth, I had my midwife look at it and she said, what am I looking at here? And I'm like, look, what, it, do you see it? And she's like, yeah, I see your little tear here, but some women aren't even connected in that area in the first place. <laughs> like, your vagina is completely normal. And I felt much more 
okay with things after that. Right. <laughs> and again, who even cares if my vagina <laughs> is like mutilated after childbirth if it doesn't, you know, look the ideal way a vagina should look. Well, it's only if you care, right? Yeah, but I think growing up with my only sex education being porn, I had this idea of what a vagina should look like Mm. and had some weirdness around my vagina even before that because my vagina didn't look like that you, you know like um what when did you discover porn i i was still in middle school so 12 or 13 is when i think i w- became you know sort of interested or sort of lurking around on the internet and did somebody from school point you to some place or um no i mean kids in school were i it was funny because Nobody pointed me to a website or anything, but somebody was talking about a blow job at lunch one day about someone who had given a blow job and I didn't really know what that was. So I went home and I, you know, as any millennial would, I looked it up on the internet right. and uh, came across some websites and it was sort of just down the rabbit hole from there. Which, as you learned when you looked it up on the internet, is a misnomer. You probably don't do a lot of blowing. Yeah. Right? (laughs) (laughs) Confused me (laughs) even after I (laughs) discovered what it was supposed to be. Why isn't it called a suck job or a lick job? I don't know. (laughs) I mean, maybe because if you... Compared to blowing a whistle, I guess. Like the way a whistle goes in your mouth? I don't know. When you say you went down the rabbit hole. So I think I I was probably a website like Pornhub or something like that. And, you know, I think I was kind of a weirdly sexual child in ways that I didn't realize until... I was reflecting on it, you know, as a young woman and as an adult. How so? Because really, children just, are sexual yeah. and um, it freaks parents out so they don't speak about it. And then people feel and kids feel weird. Yeah. And like they're doing something wrong. Yeah. But So just like with, you know, feeling sensations or I remember... <laughs> I remember like riding my bike and like feeling that when you were like going over like bumps or something like that. Mm-hmm. And I remember feeling sort of shameful about it because I knew that, you know, there was sort of this uh, zone around, you know, as my parents call them private parts that like you sort of don't speak about them you know you don't you don't touch them you don't let other people touch them so the education you got from them was this is private and stay away from it yeah and they're are they religious people um my dad is more religious but it's interesting because just from talking to my mom As an adult, my mom was very sexually active and sexually explorative. But she said to me that she just never wanted to think of me like that. Yeah. Which, I mean, with certain connotations, I understand But having a daughter of my own now, I would just want to have an open dialogue with her from the get-go about how things work. Yes. And when she does become, you know, sexually mature in her own time, I want her to be educated and understand that her body is her own and she can do with it as she pleases. Thank goodness. You're here. (laughs) This is probably the number one predictor of 
STIs and unwanted pregnancies actually is a lack of proper well, education which for is very children. interesting I'm a young mother and Alva was conceived while I was taking the birth control pill and um I and you were 18 yeah and I got birth control when I was 14, I got the Depo-Provera shot, which basically just stops your period. Because I was having very heavy, irregular periods that were causing me, you know, lots of pain and um, discomfort, and I was missing school. Mm, I started taking birth control at 16 for a similar reason. The, yeah. The, the cramps were so bad, I was just, like, on the floor of my yeah. acting teacher's classroom, curled up, you know, weeping because it mm-hmm. hurt so bad. Like, mm-hmm. And I don't – my old family doctor actually just got uh, – is currently in a malpractice suit. <laughs> so um, – Oh, my gosh. And the depo Provera shot is not something that should be used to regulate periods. Um, anything that stops your period in its tracks is probably not necessarily good for you. It doesn't seem like a good (laughs) solution unless it's needed for some extraordinary measure. Yeah, and I wasn't warned of any side effects. He never gave me, like, any rundown of what I should expect when, you know, being on this Mm. um, huge vial of hormones, essentially. It's so strange because my mom, she would not see a female gynecologist, and I only wanted a female gynecologist. Yeah. And... Looking back now, I experienced so many terrible side effects from being on Depo-Provera for two years of my life that it took me a while to work through that bitterness because there are so many very intense side effects that are pretty regular, that are pretty common with taking it. So you were on – you the, had that the shot. shot. It's so it's a three-month cycle. You go in every three months and you get a dose of it. And essentially what it does is it convinces your body it's in the early stages of pregnancy because of the hormones that are in it. And so you aren't ovulating. And so you therefore don't have a period. And – there are like weight gain, mood swings, depression, anxiety, uh, severe cystic acne, uh, so on, you know, like migraines, uh, and lots of other <laughs> not ideal, yeah. And I actually had sort of a total meltdown on Depo Provera and freaked out and hurt myself very badly. <laughs> you mean self harm? Yeah. Cutting? Yeah. And it came on basically like uh, three months after, like it came after my second dose of it. And I hadn't ever felt like that before. I hadn't ever felt depressed or anxious, or I had never had what I now know is a panic attack until then. Oh, wow. And I think that the combination of being, you know, uh, already... 12 (laughs) or 13 years old. I was 14, so obviously I'm very totally not emotionally developed and combine it with this crazy dose of hormones, of course, you could expect one to totally freak their freak. Right. And now... (laughs) As I said, that doctor's in a malpractice suit and no longer allowed to prescribe any medication because Mm -hmm. of a similar circumstance he had with prescribing something and not warning someone about side effects. Oh, my God. (laughs) But then, so I went off Depo Revere when I was 16 and I transitioned into the pill and I had been on a round of antibiotics a couple weeks before what I now know is around the time that Elva was conceived. And I didn't know that that could affect your birth control. I didn't know that if you take antibiotics, it can affect your birth control. I didn't know that either. Yeah. And then when later talking to my 
midwife. There are all sorts of other things that can affect, especially birth control pills, like uh, birth control that is taken orally, because um, the way a lot of them are sort of a slow release. So if you're not taking it at the right time every day, your dosage could be inconsistent. Two of the nurses that I had throughout my uh, prenatal care said that their some of their children they had been on the birth control pill oh my when goodness but I do think that my situation is more of an isolated incident just with my partner you know being in a place in their life where they were ready and stable enough to support not only a baby but me through that transition time and um because it was essentially right after high school right yeah and I made the decision to you know follow through with the pregnancy and um did you have a deliberation process I did a little bit but I think it was more so because of pressure that I felt from my family more so than what I felt on my own you said your mom had you when she was really young and she no my mom had me when she was 30 my mom had me later in life but she had an unwanted pregnancy when she was my age oh okay and then she didn't want you yeah to have a child at that at the age that you were yeah because she didn't want it yeah when she was your age yeah And my dad really, um, it's very interesting because my dad has always been the one who, I lived with my dad throughout high school. I lived, my parents got divorced when I was a young child and I lived with my mom up until I was 14 and then I moved in with my dad. And he, I think, knew that I was sexually active, but it was just something that was not spoken about. And I told my mom that I was, I took a test with my mom first and I took one test and I had that uh, dialogue with my mother about what she thought I should do. And then I later talked to my dad about it. And my dad actually went out very late at night to get me another box of pregnancy tests <sighs> To so that I could, you know, just sort of reconfirm that uh, we were seeing the results right. And he had already found out about my relationship with Tom and was very angry and totally unsupportive of it and sort of had told me that he was going to um, cut me off completely from any kind of support if I did end up choosing to continue my relationship with Tom. But... Mm. And that happened? No. um, Because I found out I was pregnant pretty shortly after that conversation with my dad happened. And he immediately uh, sort of held me and he cried with me. And um, he called Tom the next day. And uh, they sort of had (laughs) a man-to-man talk as one would call it and I think Tom made his intentions very clear with how he wanted to proceed and that he wanted to support me and wanted to support this baby and marry you yeah and I don't (laughs) recommend getting married when you're 18 to anyone I don't think anyone should do that ever (laughs) do not take um, you know Tom and I have been married for two years now and things are wonderful and going great but uh how old was he when you met him he's 36 and I really do think that it is an isolated incident and I I was fully aware that when I chose to marry Tom and chose to have a baby with him that I was going into this situation not knowing myself and I cannot say that I know myself completely now but I do know myself and have 
changed and grown immensely even in just the past two years as I will continue to do throughout my 20s. And I think that understanding that about myself and Tom also understanding that about me has made things go a little more smoothly because I think that and even with my previous experiences with older men it wasn't ever about me it wasn't ever about me as a person it was about me as you know this young fantasy girl it was about you know acting out this idea of being with a younger woman. When did you realize you were attracted to older men? I, th- I think I always have been attracted to older men. I even remember being younger and being attracted to older men, even, you know, when I was like 10 and 11. And How much older? I mean, just always men in the sort of age range of like 30 like 30 to 50 um and i i don't i don't consider myself to have uh, you know quote unquote daddy issues but i have just growing up around i think even my mom and her friends, I've always felt a little more comfortable around the adults. Um, Me too. Yeah. I didn't, I, I mean, I was an only child and I didn't have, I don't think I had a lot of friends as a, as a really young yeah, child. Yeah, neither, neither did I. And even throughout high school, I felt very out of place and weird. And. How so? Just that, like, I felt. Not that I felt like I was necessarily more mature than my peers, because I do think that when we think we're, like, at our most mature, we're probably at our most immature. (laughs) Um, I just felt like I couldn't necessarily relate relate to them in many ways, other than that we were sort of in the same place at the same time. And it's not to say that I didn't have friends... And that I don't still, you know, communicate with people from that time in my life regularly. It's just that I found it, and I don't know if maybe it, it had more to do with me being more introverted than most of the people in my school. My school wasn't very big. As you know, my graduating class was like 65 people. Oh, my gosh. And I think just the regular activities were, it was just, you know, sporting events at the school and then parties after. And I wasn't ever really interested in partying or drinking or anything like that. Um, I wasn't either. And because of that, I just wasn't, um, I just didn't have many connections because that's what pretty much everybody was doing. I had some one-on-one connections that were really strong in high school, but I wasn't a part of any social group, a strong social group. And I know exactly what you're talking about. I had one-on-one connections with you know, a couple of people from different social groups, but I never, like, fit into one group. And I think it made made going through high school a little harder for me and a little, you know, it was a a little less enjoyable for me than it would have been if I had found a group that, you know, was interested in, you know, the same things I was or was absolutely yeah or you know was disinterested in the same things that I was disinterested in and so I went outside of my high school in order to seek social groups and social validation and attention and where I wound up going was the renaissance fair really yeah which I absolutely adored and (laughs) with with no 
no sense of how it might be kitschy or mm -hmm. I knew that I, w I went to an arts high school and I was in an, an acting program. So I knew that it wasn't highly respected by <laughs> but I didn't. I didn't think of it that way. I just thought it was so great. How fun that we get to dress up in corsets and skirts and, you know, eat turkey legs and be sung to by troubadours and, <laughs> you know, get roses sent with messages to to people that we thought were cute. And I just thought it was delightful. And there was a guy working there, and I think I was 14, 14 or 15, and he was 30, I'm pretty sure. He was already just beginning to show some receding hair. I, I love a good baldy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't particularly into that part, but I was really into him. He was extremely talented. He played this super flamboyant Archbishop of Canterbury character. <laughs> and I thought he was a great performer, so I admired him in that way. And there's a certain turn on when somebody is really talented yeah. for me. And we would go for these long walks around the festival grounds. And I was playing a peasant because it was my first year and everybody plays a peasant their first year. And so it was a little strange for the Archbishop of Canterbury <laughs> to, be, to be walking around the grounds with a peasant, right? And... But that is that is what happened. And he was aware of my regard for him. And he he was definitely attracted to me. He did kiss me at one of the parties. That's when I liked to go to parties. I liked to go to the Renaissance Fair parties because I felt connected. And I also felt like I was everybody's little sister. Like everybody was looking out for me because they were all in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. And I was one of the only young people yeah. Who, who was there so I was I was the one to take care of and they gave me rides and they protected me and they you know they comforted me were and... your parents very hands off no no well but my parents divorced when I was 12 so I was only living with my mother my mother was kind of smothery in her attention and I often wanted to just escape that attention oh yeah <laughs> and she I don't know if she ever found out about my my infatuation with with this guy at the Renaissance Fair but eventually he and he gave me this CD of the TV show from the 80s I think or maybe the 90s Beauty and the Beast <laughs> with this this incredibly resonant voice reading poetry and this romantic music and then he gave him this, this improvisational piano David Lawn's Return to the Heart which I still have the, my body knows that music and what follows each song yeah. because I listened to it so many times when I was so young and have impressionable you, have you been in contact with him since? no so well I maybe a few years later but the culmination of that was him saying, I think you wrote me a letter. And I, I found it when I was going through some of my things when the last time I was in Florida. And he said that he couldn't do that to me. That he couldn't kind of pluck me, you know, off the vine and... He said that he felt I would eventually say he had taken the best years of my life. Yeah, and I think Tom has some sort of anxiousness and worry about that also. And there was a period early in our relationship where he came to me and sort of we talked through it and he said that he felt like he was a bad person for being with me and wanting to be with me for that same reason because Tom you know had already had this very you know rich experience in his 20s in New York City and you know had 
all these friends and um, different experiences, just like traveling and performing. And he had found himself and found his passion already. And I think that is the biggest issue in age gap relationships is it can be hard to level with someone who doesn't know themselves or know what they're super passionate about yet. Mm. And he was worried that me being with him from that point on was going to hinder me. Right. And I think I would be lying if I said that being a young mother and being married the past couple of years hasn't hindered me because it has, you know, it put my um, so, Your studies on hold. Yeah, it put my studies on hold. It put any real space for me to be able to continue on my journey of self-discovery on hold completely. But I understood that. I, I didn't necessarily know how how much it would put it on hold, but I knew that my experience in my early 20s was not going to be similar to my peer groups. Right. But you Um, don't think it's a part of your... No, it totally is a part. And I think that in some ways, I feel like I have sort of a jump on my peers, even though they are, you know, a year ahead of me in their studies, I don't have the room to fuck up. Like, Mm -hmm. like I, there's not room for me to be irresponsible in that department because it's not just like my future writing on it. It is also, you know, my child's and. You're not messing around. Yeah. And I am grateful for that. It's that time. Time for some credit. This episode was edited by Chad Michael Snavely, podcast maven. Check out his entire roster by heading to chadmichael.com. My lovely intro music was created by the nicest rock star in the world, Alan Markley. He's on Instagram as Plastic Cannons. The horizontal cover art was illustrated by Shauna Shea, which is spelled S-H-A-Y, and her playful, sensual work can be found on 99designs. Each week, I'm reading one of my generous, eloquent five-star reviews in gratitude to my listeners. This one, by Selesnia Mage, is thorough, and titled, Excellent Interviews with an Intimate Twist. It reads, Despite myself having practiced non-monogamy and polyamory for four years, With so wide a range of experience, and never shying away from reading about experiences outside of my own, I find myself perpetually and delightfully surprised, listening to this podcast, at just how much more there is for me to learn about the wide world of non-traditional expressions of love and sex through the fascinating guest perts in Lila's rich tapestry of relationships of all kinds. The brilliant conceit of this show is that the intended atmosphere of lying in bed alongside two individuals engaging in extremely intimate, personal pillow talk is that not only does Lila give off the appearance of being in a romantic relationship with her guests, but you're made to feel an immediate connection to them as well, establishing a much deeper connection than you've ever experienced on any other interview podcast. There's really nothing else like it. Even in my most cynical interpretation of this show, merely being content marketing for Hacienda Villa, the content is so darn good that who cares if that was the case? Side note, that's not the case. One day, all content will be sponsored. Quote, I, for one, embrace our new corporate overlords. Unquote. But nothing will be as genuinely vulnerable and raw and exciting and needed as this podcast. The bottom line is that this is a unique show with a very well-executed gimmick 
that I recommend to anyone who wants to learn more about non-monogamy, polyamory, play parties, kink, sex positivity, and everything in between. Dear Celesnia Mage, you do my project a great honor with the care you took and the time you invested in crafting that review. I receive it with great gratitude. Thank you. Until next week, dear ones, may you have someone to love, something to do, and something to look forward to. It's been a pleasure to lie down for you. Oh, and you know what it's time for. Selfie time. And we have to look there. I always oh. look I always look at myself and then, and then I forget. You're so pretty. <laughs> okay. Oh. Oops. Oops. I pressed something, but I don't know what I pressed. Okay. Selfie. <laughs> You're going. <laughs> I'm just trying to find a good angle.